Hello, everyone, and greetings from Baltimore, Maryland, the home of the Peabody Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. My name is Abra Bush, and I am the Senior Associate Dean of Institute Studies here at Peabody. I'm delighted that you could join us today for Moving Away from No Pain, No Gain, Performance Science and Therapeutic Care in Conservatory Training. Before we get started, I'd like to thank several Peabody staff members who, as always, are joining us today and supporting this event. Adam Scalici from Peabody's production team will be in the background monitoring the webinar and working through any technical challenges we may encounter. If you have any of those, please send those directly to Adam in the chat. Patrick Wallen from the Dean's Office will provide any additional support and Robin McGinnis from Peabody's Launchpad is here to help me curate your questions. A very special thank you to all of them. A few quick notes before we begin. It would be great if you could hop into the chat and introduce yourself to both the panelists and the attendees. Please make sure that under two, all panelists and attendees are checked. We'd love to hear from you. Um, love to know where you're from and hope you'll consider this an interactive session. The chat will be open throughout. The presenters will spend about half of their time on their presentation, after which we'll reserve the remainder of the time for questions and comments from you. Please place your questions into the Q&A area of the webinar so that we can easily find them. Also, please note that the presenters have agreed to permit us to record this webinar. A special thank you to each of them for that. This session will be posted to the Peabody Keep Teaching website within a few days so that you can access it and forward it as you would like. And now without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome our guest presenters for today. Their bios are all available on their website. But in the meantime, I'd like to introduce Liliana Araujo, Program Leader and Senior Lecturer in Performance Psychology across the Faculties of Music and Dance at the Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance in the UK. Sarah Bestepe Gray is a performer, lecturer, consultant, and pedagogue, holds a medical degree from Hacettepe University in Ankara, Turkey, and, and degrees in guitar performance. She's also on the Peabody faculty. Chris Chesky is professor of music, founding director of the Texas Center for Performing Arts Health at the University of North Texas. My colleague, Sarah Hoover, will be moderating this session today. She is the Associate Dean for Innovation, Interdisciplinary Partnerships and Community Initiatives at the Peabody Institute. Ken Johnson is director of outpatient rehabilitation and therapy services at Johns Hopkins Medicines, Medicines Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Andrea Lasner is Director of the Performing Arts Physical Therapy Program at the Johns Hopkins Hospitals. And Dr. Ralph Manchester is Director of the University Health Services at the University of Rochester, Professor in the Department of Medicine, Vice Provost, and a Fellow in the American College of Physicians. It gives me great pleasure to welcome these fine colleagues to Peabody today to share with us um, this important information about performance science. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Sarah? Thank you all so much. It's wonderful to have you join us today. Uh, we're hoping this will be a lively conversation and that you will share your questions and comments as we move forward. Uh, it is a great honor to have a panel of such distinguished folks who've been doing work at the intersection of the performing arts and, and uh, artist care for a number of decades. They have lots of lived experience that I'm sure they're gonna share with you. So to begin today, I'm gonna to ask each of um, our panelists uh, to spend no more than two minutes giving an overview of their program. Uh, and then we'll dig into some questions. So without further ado, I'm going Did you, uh, I'm so sorry, I believe I was muted and talking, did you hear me? Okay, let, let me start that again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to my esteemed colleagues. We hope that this is truly interactive. Uh, so please uh, don't keep yourself on mute because that won't make interaction work very well. Uh, so put your comments in the chat. We're gonna begin this by having each of my distinguished colleagues uh, give a two minute overview of their program. And then we will move from there into a few questions that I've put together, and then we will move on to your questions. So now, without further ado, I'm going to ask Liliana Araujo to give her uh, program overview for us. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. And actually, I want to thank you and your team for the opportunity to join from London. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all well. Um, I'm Liliana Araujo, and I'm a senior lecturer in, in performance psychology at Trinity Lab and Conservatory of Music and Dance and also program leader of the MAC and MFA in dance science. So I have one foot in each faculty. I work for the music and dance faculty, which is a great opportunity to learn from two distinctive uh, performing arts fields, but at the same time, quite complementary. So I just wanted to give you very shortly uh, an overview of some of the work I've been involved in and how Trinity Laban has been uh, addressing these post-COVID or COVID-19 uh, measures as part uh, embedded in the learning and teaching uh, that we offer. So for those who don't know us, Trinity Laban is a conservatory of music and dance. We have programs in music, dance and musical theater. And uh, just to start by saying what kind of measures we uh, implemented uh, in this COVID-19 era, which we'll probably talk a little bit more during the discussion. So we adopted a blended learning approach um, with sm smaller groups of learning, and we invested mostly in social distancing and with enhanced safety and cleaning measures. I'm very aware that is very dependent on the country we are in and the kind of government guidelines that we have, but, and the things will change or probably are in the process of changing, but that's the measures we have at the moment. I've been also involved in terms of the curricula in delivering mostly uh, all modules related to music psychology and psychology in music performance and, and other sessions related to health and well-being for uh, musicians. And I can talk a little bit about that throughout the discussion. I also want to share with you that we have been involved in a cross-faculty research project on the psychological impact of virtual learning and teaching as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. We are in the process of analyzing the data and we'll be able to share with you the link for uh, the Trinity Lab and page where we'll post some of those findings very soon and I can share some of them with you very soon. And finally, I want to share with you that we have a health clinic and conditioning student, a studio that is open to all our music and dance stu students, where we offer clinical support like physiotherapy and triage, sports massage, acupuncture and craniosacral therapy, but also where students can engage with conditioning uh, classes from Pilates, yoga for musicians and so on. And we adapted all these provisions to be available to students in these COVID-19 um, uh, circumstances. Uh, and that's it for me. We'll have more opportunities to talk about these things throughout the discussion. Thank you so much, Liana. Uh, next, Ralph. Ralph, you may still be muted. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the discussion today. Um, the program that we have here at the um, Eastman School of Music um, has several components to it, um, some of which have changed a little um, as a result of COVID. Um, in terms of how we go about orienting um, students who are starting at the Eastman School to the uh, performance-related health issues that they should be aware of, um, normally, we would have a face-to-face um, -face session um, with uh, one for entering undergraduate students and another one for entering graduate students, but that was one of the COVID casualties um, for this year, and um, I'm going to be working with um, Eastman School leadership to see if we can get that done at least um, uh, virtually as students um, return for the spring semester. We are fortunate to be able to provide um, on-site um, care for Eastman students at the school. And we have uh, uh, physicians, registered nurses, and uh, counselors who are all available to Eastman students on a prepaid basis. So there's no out-of-pocket cost. We also have physical therapists there um, but that needs to be billed through their insurance coverage. 
We have a pretty extensive referral network through the Eastman Performing Arts Medicine Program here in Rochester. And um, we make use of them for um, specialists in neurology, orthopedics, um, ear, nose, and throat, et cetera. And the Eastman Performing Arts Medicine Program also includes um, a, a pretty robust mix of performances in healthcare settings, music therapy for patients, um, and a uh, research component as well. We don't have um, any formal return to play guidelines. Um, we customize those for um, each individual student we're seeing. And as I mentioned, um, the research uh, program that involves Eastman students is um, a 38 year database on the incidence of performing uh, performance related musculoskeletal disorders that we just add more information to each year um, as um, we're seeing the students here. So that's a quick summary of what's happening here in Rochester. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Andrea, I believe you're next. Yes, thank you, Sarah. And we will be talking about what's going on here in Baltimore with the Peabody Institute um, and in collaboration with Johns Hopkins Medicine. So this sits underneath our Hopkins umbrella. Um, so we have the hospital, we have the whole medical institution, and then of course, part of the university side, we have Peabody Conservatory. Um, so really with collaboration with Johns Hopkins Medicine and the Institute, we have formed this Performing Arts Health and Wellness Program. And underneath the institution, we have about three different pillars, our main pillars of clinical services, education and research that our institution mission um, stands from. So going into the clinical services, this really came with the collaboration from Johns Hopkins Rehabilitation Network, where us as clinicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, um, we have just recently, since 2018, opened a brand new clinic on campus to allow for uh, students and faculty to obtain uh, rehabilitation for any injuries uh, right there that are um, covered by insurance as well as advisement sessions where the, uh, students or faculty can seek questions on when there is pain, what do I do, how do I find a provider or resource. Um, and really in this time of COVID, we've moved this um, whole just normal regular routine of it being in person to telehealth where we can do more telehealth visits um, and advisement sessions being more remote that way. And with the screenings, those are kind of all kind of put on hold, but we've started to screen um, musicians and dancers to be able to keep them on track of um, best practices for them. Um, there are other clinical services through the Student Health and Wellness Center and just looking at mental health, which is a big component for COVID um, time right now with being remote learning. Um, and then of course, we're able to kind of funnel to the orthopedic neurology and PMN R referral sources if they need further resources that way. In our education, we've really kind of paired um, curricular that there's a playing well course where students can enroll um, over a series of courses to understand different components of health and wellness. Um, for themselves as a performing artist. And um, we've been doing peak performance fundamentals, which is more of a co-curricular program. It usually happens that first week of orientation where we've provided um, asynchronous and synchronous, especially this year through Zoom um, and providing Q&A, uh, doing wellness workshops and seminars um, to kind of get them going for when they do come back in person to really kind of tie back around and bring them more awareness to their health and wellness. Um, on the physical therapy side, we do have a performing arts PT fellowship program um, where physical therapists can further their training expertise. And then our whole list of research, as you can see in instrument dance and voice, where we've paired up with mechanical engineering, the neurology department, um, and also the rehab network where we've really collaborated um, throughout the institution. 
Thank you, Andrea. And just to let you all know, we will put these slides, um, we will post these slides so you can all look at the um, information later. Finally, last but definitely not least, Chris. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you for inviting me and representing UNT here at this uh, awesome event. Glad to be here. Um, so I guess I'd start with saying that our center started in 1999. So we've got uh, quite a bit of uh, trials and tribulations and successes under our belt as we've tried to move this agenda forward here at the largest school of music in the United States. It's been full of opportunities and challenges. And uh, I think over the last several years, we've made some significant advances uh, that I'd like to share a little bit with you today. Uh, plus, I'd also like to welcome all of the students that are logging in. I think the one of the opportunities here is that we uh, encourage our younger music faculty, potential music faculty, graduate students to uh, engage in this area of research and service and education so that uh, we can advance the idea that we would be uh, educating young musicians, particularly those who are starting off in middle and high school. Um, so I, I suppose one of our biggest accomplishments back in 2004 with Ralph was the Health Promotion of Schools of Music project that led to national accreditation changes and uh, got us all in our NASM schools thinking about what we can do in, in, in the School of Music environment to address these concerns. Unique to Texas is the subsequent adoption of educational standards that are now mandated uh, for all music educators across the state. And uh, for those who are aware of music education, Texas is one of the behemoths in the world for this kind of education. And the Texas Education Agency now requires all band, choir, and orchestra teachers to meet learning objectives uh, from sixth grade through 12th. So that's a really uh, fascinating uh, new um, uh, phenomenon that we hope other states will follow in, in the next couple of years. Uh, my center is co-founded with a uh, medical faculty, Bernard Rubin, who since retired and then was replaced with Savid Survey. Dr. Survey is a professor of medicine and has taken the lead on developing uh, more uh, robust clinical services on behalf of our students. Uh, so we have clinics in Fort Worth and on our Denton campus, literally a, a few minute walk from the College of Music. And we're now moving into uh, uh, discussions with the university to extend these services to the community as well as faculty. So numerous students uh, uh, participate in this free health service uh, on behalf of uh, uh, managed through the uh, medical school in Fort Worth. And that clinical operation also serves medical students training. We have the first ever physician fellowship, uh, which we completed last year. Uh, for people interested, physicians interested in performing arts health. We also have strong relationships with our audiology, speech language pathology, and psychology departments, all of which are active in serving the needs of our music students. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the educational aspects of what we've been doing, we've had uh, a long history of an undergraduate course that has served uh, probably north of 3,000 students to date that was built into the university's core curriculum, which allowed us to not only teach uh, students in music about these issues, but any student who might be interested in occupational health. And the uh, core curriculum mandated by the state started to shift, so we lost some opportunities with uh, uh, considering this course as meeting uh, a set of mandatory requirements. So in lieu of that, we have uh, just been approved for a junior level undergraduate course, uh, specifically for music majors, which will start next fall. At the graduate level, we've had uh, a uh, related field uh, for our masters in performance and our doctoral level performance majors for many years. And that has served us well. So students do dissertations or thesis in this area and uh, it pioneered all kinds of vectors of research and probably more, more importantly, have ended up in uh, universities and colleges and schools of music across the country. So we sort of like planting the seed here, they get a little training and then they go out and uh, serve as academic uh, faculty in schools of music. We had one uh, recently that won an award actually last year, uh, Sarah Dunbar uh, uh, at the PAMA conference, who just uh, assumed her first tenure track position and she's already being asked to develop an undergraduate 
performing arts health course for that university. So we Chris, have students. Uh, Chris, yes. may I ask you to pause there so we can make sure yeah. that we get to some of the questions? Thank you. When, yes. you, when you have a long tenure of, of program development, you have a lot to say, which is great news, but I wanna make sure we do get a chance to have a little dialogue. So to, fl to flip into that dialogue, I'm gonna show one more slide as a way of kicking off this question of the, that, is with the, that goes with the title of our program, uh, moving away from no pain, no gain. So this is a, uh, in our orientation events for incoming students, we did drop a poll to them and ask them what uh, are the primary cultural perceptions and attitudes around, perce uh, around performance injury that they experience. And I'm uh, sorry to say that the culture of no pain, no gain was top of the list, uh, tied with la little um, or lack of public awareness for these issues. So I just highlight that to begin um, our, our, our questions. And I'm gonna um, take away the slides now and say, just ask um, if, you know, where are we with this no pain, no gain culture? And, um, you know, is, have you made, have you all been able to make any progress with this over the course of the time that you've been doing the work that you've been doing? Um, what might be some some positive, um, encouraging signs of where we are now? And I would ask our panelists if you could just um, maybe just raise your hand uh, and let me know if there's somebody who'd like to jump in here. Yes, Ralph. So <clears throat> I don't <clears throat> have any uh, quantitative data on this, but my perception having um, been here since 1983 is that there is less of the no pain, no gain mentality than there was in the 80s and 90s. And I think more of the faculty are uh, aware and talk with their students about the importance of um, practicing and performing in ways that does not um, damage the body. But I think um, the music field is still extremely competitive and no matter what a student's teacher says, um, there will always be pressure to spend more time um, developing one's uh, physical uh, capabilities um, as a musician. And um, for all but the luckiest, um, that at some point will probably lead to some kind of uh, problem. Um, so I think we're, we've made progress. I think we're making progress, um, but um, we still have a ways to go. Thank you. Liliana, did you? Yes, you looked like you were about to. <laughs> Um, well, uh, as, as Ralph said, I also don't have like quantitative like statistics to show in that matter. Um, and I don't have the length of experience as, as some, some of the esteemed colleagues in this room. But I would say from my experience, both in, in a orchestral setting, because I also work as freelance consultant and researcher for or orchestras and in the educational setting, that actually we observe here that that change is happening in terms of how there's more awareness of the importance of musicians' health and well-being for their performance standards, for their, you know, for high performance. But I do still believe that in somehow that is still embodied uh, in the way musicians approach and especially young musicians approach their, uh, their practice and performance. Um, I, I've seen progress uh, throughout the years in the way the students bring different approaches to their health and well-being. They they want you know they they are more aware that that is important to be healthy to strength to strengthen to, to look after their bodies to look after their mind, but they don't know yet fully how to do it. And there's still it seems to be that there's still those embodied. That's the only expression. I think it's you know. It's only when you ask 
them literally uh, how important it is to practice more efficiently to you know maybe not have so many hours of, of practice or reflect on how their practices can be more efficient and more healthy that then they become almost like aware of um something that they already doing but they are for somehow that those beliefs are still within them but i would say that the field is progressing quite substantially in the past in the, the past couple of years or at least here in the uk thank you chris did you have your hand up yes i just wanted to point our attention towards the act of music making or act of learning in, in performing music as the primary factor that drives these concerns you know, so how we do our music, how we guide a student in the act of learning is the central theme of our program. So we need to pull into the discussion, all of our ensemble directors, all of our studio faculty, all of our composers, all of our music educators, because that is the discipline of music in a broad sense that controls the risk, right? And, and, and it's so fascinating. To, we've been doing a lot with hearing loss, um, for many, many years. And, it, and it's very clear to me that the way we organize our sounds generated from an ensemble have a direct impact on the health of the hearing system. And if we can learn how to better manage, uh, understand and manage these, these uh, music making behaviors, we will have an opportunity to reduce risk. So from a cultural social standpoint, the adoption of that attitude is starting to creep more into the performance faculty. So their sense of ownership of these challenges is, is where I see the, the big shift occurring. Mm -hmm. And especially as we, we move uh, doctoral students out into schools and other areas of the country, they can bring that attitude. So we're thinking about scheduling, conducting, repertoire, pacing, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, brick by brick, absolutely. Um, so Rob, do you wanna say anything about, uh, yes, sorry, go ahead. Um, I completely agree with Chris that the, uh, the risk is controlled by what uh, we do when we do actively make music and uh, teachers are a, a huge part of this. Um, in, in another poll that uh, we gave, uh, I don't know if, are you going to talk about that? Um, the students uh, uh, declared that 82% of the students would go to their teacher if they had a problem. Um, a pain. So, so it is very important that we do get the the faculty to own this and realize that the the, the risk lies in the act of music making, and um, that would be, I think, the next uh, direction of push. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask if there's. Um, you all did address this, but I'd like to speak more pointedly to COVID. Um, what have you seen? You know, some of some folks have had students on campus. Some folks have had students only remotely. I think we've got the full gamut here. Um, what have you seen over the course of this semester as the effects um, of the current environment of learning, however it's con constituted? Um, on the performance health of your students. Ralph? Yeah, um, we've seen a marked reduction in the number of Eastman students who are making appointments to be seen um, mm -hmm. at the clinic. Um, and we've been asking um, through our channels about why this is and um, while we expect some reduction because we do have a mix of um, in-person um, and online instruction, um, it's, uh, the reduction in visits is way out of proportion um, to the reduction in number of um, students who are here on campus. And um, what we're hearing is a reluctance to come into the health service for fear that we will identify them as um, having symptoms that require them to go into isolation while we wait for a COVID test to come back and therefore they will miss 
their lessons, uh, rehearsals, uh, practice time, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And while that uh, actually is a legitimate concern if they're coming in with respiratory symptoms or something else that could be COVID related, um, it shouldn't be a concern if they have what's obviously a performance related musculoskeletal problem. And, you know, we're not here to look for reasons to put students into isolation unnecessarily. Um, but uh, from their point of view, that's a legitimate concern. And that makes us concerned about whether um, they are having problems that they are trying to ignore. And uh, I think we all know what that often leads to. Um, or if perhaps they are modifying their practice um, schedule so that um, they think they're reducing their risk of having an injury, but they're doing it in a way that's also interfering with them accomplishing their musical goals. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously those are things they're gonna have to work with their teachers on, um, but um, I'm concerned because I think we're going to be facing the same thing during the spring semester. And that's basically, that's a whole academic year of um, a sub what could be a suboptimal experience for the students. Andrea, I'm aware because I've been in meetings with you on a biweekly basis that um, the usage of the Peabody Clinic is way down. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that and offer any thoughts about why that may be happening? Yeah, a lot of it is, you know, we have a great bit of international students, so trying to deliver telehealth access in that regard, um, and also just reciprocity for PT and OT services across the United States as well is kind of our limit. Um, and also, a lot of students, it's an, a newer clinic of, you know, the the students that are in their junior and senior year, they might know of the clinic, or there still is this there is a clinic, but I don't know where it is. So we're kind of still working on <laughs> who we are, which has actually been a great change of being remote because now we're trying to extend out a little bit more doing advisement sessions. And it's easier to you know create a, a, an appointment time through a Zoom and talk with the student to help give them some guidance of these are maybe some things to try to do if they're having pain, maybe seek this person or that person, or it's kind of an avenue to bring them into um, PTOT if it is telehealth and works that way. But yeah, it's been very challenging to get this patient population, make sure that they are taking care of themselves. Um, you know, speaking from the dance side of things, right? Surfaces at home with dancers, they're getting different injuries um, now, or they're not jumping as much. So their tendons are starting to you know, not have that pliability um, versus kind of the instrumentalist side, you know, of different issues and, and practice issues there. Thank you, Andrea. It turns out we just got a comment, a question from one of the um, uh, attendees that I'd like to share here. One of my biggest concerns now is the fact that musicians and students may have reduced their playing activity due to the pandemic. And if they did not keep up individually with staying fit, not only playing, but also body-wise, once their activity resumes, we could face a big boom of injury. Do you all foresee this? Anyone want to respond? Yeah, Chris, and then uh, Liliana. Yeah, I, 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 I also want to reiterate, our, our clinical traffic has been lower, but it's starting to tick up now uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but in terms of the playing, I've heard from studio faculty that students are more prepared for their lessons. And it's probably due to the fact that they are not going anywhere and not doing much other than, you know, staying at home and spending their time practicing. So I think there's, there's uh, engagement, but in terms of ensembles, definitely not. Uh, even though some are, are continuing to, to meet routinely. Uh, but the, the the socialization part is the one I'm most concerned about. You know, students seem to be disconnected from the faculty. In fact, the uh, 15 students that have logged on today in my class, I have yet to have met physically one of them. You know, so it, there's a social disconnection that I think is a problem uh, that's going to emerge 
uh, later on, especially as we reflect on all of our identity research that shows the importance of having this social identity intact uh, as you become a musician and professional. So, Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Liliana, did you want to add something? Yes, and actually, let me just follow up from what Chris uh, was saying. Uh, we also have those concerns in terms of engagement, so the sense of belonging. And I think we have here um, two different situations. One was the one that happened in, in March when we uh, started, we went into lockdown with a cohort of students that have been in a traditional uh, learning uh, environment, you know, having in-person sessions and very little digital interaction um, to something that was completely online. And I think those students really struggled. And from a, a short uh, research uh, study that we did, it was really interesting to see that actually their levels of belonging and relatedness were not that bad what they uh, felt that was more um, that was that there was a bigger impact mostly on their sense of competence and especially on their motivation due to the absence of um, gigs or performance or recital so the removal of those external kind of events or motivators seem to have a, a quite big impact on their motivational levels. Um, somehow we, you, you know, people felt that there was some level of connected, uh, connectedness and relatedness during that period. Mm -hmm. And I think that those students that have been through that um, will, will have a different experience from the students that have started now in September with us. I know that the academic years mm -hmm. are different mm -hmm. because they, in a way, they kind of know what's happening at the moment is not unexpected anymore and their levels of engagement are probably different. Now, I think it's too soon to say what's happening or what's not happening, but I think we have to keep in mind that we are talking about two different experiences, even within this COVID experience. And I just wanted to also to say that in terms of this question, in terms of preparedness, um, one of the things that uh, we did at Trinity Lab and but I also did with other uh, contexts was to prepare the students to do is to kind of reflect on what is really essential practice. How do we want mm -hmm. to define practice in this context? Can we make a practice much more efficient and reflective than actually just hours of practice? And I think that kind of made all of us rethink the way uh, we work in this context. Uh, I had an experience with uh, an orchestra here in the UK where we designed a re return to work program, acknowledging that some musicians may have been practiced for this period of time. Other musicians may not even touch their instrument, depending on their instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did was design a return to work program where we acknowledge all the different levels of musicians, uh, levels of practice and engagement. And we kind of designed uh, almost like a practice calculator where depending on where they were, uh, we could give recommendations on how to progressively engage in increasing levels of practice, almost like a periodized uh, practice to that before they went into uh, making music uh, back to work. Mm -hmm. So uh, this didn't fully kind of uh, wasn't fully in this deliberate way at the conservatoire here, but it's something that we kind of acknowledge as well. Progress, how can we increase practice progressively to uh, avoid the risk of injury, give health support, induction sessions, uh, triage online, that's what we do uh, as a starting point, triage online, and then when needed, physiotherapy, um, um, in person uh, to give the support system for students to progressively develop their uh, practice levels, uh, but also allow them to reflect on how their practice can be more efficient and maximize the benefits of their practice. Thank you, Liliana. Um, I, I would just like to pull a few threads from this um, and combine it with a, a comment or a question somebody asked in, in the uh, questions. 
Um, is anyone seeing a change in pedagogy toward more efficient technique and biomechanics of performance? And I think, you know, prior to COVID, we might have answered that question one way, but I wonder, and I wonder if you all may be suggesting that the circumstances of COVID, whether it's um, a, a shrinking of opportunities to perform or more free time or different modalities of uh, education, all of the above, um, do you think that COVID, the, the COVID scenario itself may drive um, a change in terms of um, more efficient uh, uh, practice and practice technique? I think there's gonna be a negative impact on uh, performance technique due to the lack of opportunities to play out and play in big environments, play collectively, and the use of earphones and earbuds and, and computers for the sound that they're, they're generating and communicating and listening to, you know, it's all compressed dynamics. And, uh, you know, I'm a trumpet player and there's no way I could, you know, if I was a college kid, be able to play in my parents' house the way I would play at the university inside of a, a you know, a, I think there's gonna be a, uh, uh, an impact on hearing health, uh, eye health, which is a couple of my students have brought attention to the, the research now showing that the pandemic is now straining the eyes in ways that are unprecedented because you're always staring into a computer monitor. So all these listening and, and habits and even, even the idea that you're taking lessons on Zoom and you're looking at the teacher while you're playing changes your posture um, all that kind of stuff. So I think there might be some negative ramifications associated with uh, these platforms for learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, uh, yes, Sarab, and then I'd like to turn to a different topic after that. Right, I was looking at the chat and um, Amy Leiker was mentioning that because students are now recording more, because that's how you can, uh, in, in most cases, especially ensembles, that's how you submit. Um, your work and if they're hearing themselves more, so that might actually uh, benefit their practice, which we tell them to do when there's no COVID. <laughs> now they have to do. On the other hand, I see, uh, as Chris was also mentioning, uh, in addition to eyes and the ears, uh, there's a lot of computers which, which are uh, also affecting the um, upper extremity of the musicians. So whether we will have a boom of uh, injury after the COVID is over or whether we're going to start that boom earlier than that, I think we, sh we shall see. You know, it's interesting. I've been hearing at Peabody that, um, you know, to your point, Chris, about trumpet playing or, or color tour sopranos, right? There's some things that really don't work well in a small space um, over uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, equipment that we have. Um, other instruments, not so much. Um, our guitar department has been reporting a lot of success with online learning and online uh, interaction. So, you know, I think we may see also just a, quite a, a, a diversity of responses depending upon what the instrument is um, and how, how the, the learning environment has been going. I'd like to turn to another question that's asked by someone, and this is something I definitely wanted to get to with you all. Um, many of you have described collaborative programs between arts curriculum and medical and wellness. What was the process like for implementing these collaborative programs? Do you have any advice for someone looking to try to start this kind of collaboration? I'm sure there's a lot of information here. So even some general discussion would be great. Uh, I was thinking about the lived experience of the, of the Ralph Manchester's and the Chris Chesky's of the world in, partic you know, in particular. Um, how, what advice would you give to folks who are uh, really starting to think um, about these things um, and, and hope hopeful that they might be able to begin such a program at their institution. Chris, did you yeah, want to? Let me, uh, let me take a quick pass at it. I've been immersed in this, this issue for the last several years as we launched the first PhD in music in this space, right? So it requires an, an ongoing sustainable uh, relationship with multiple 
uh, colleges and departments across our system by design. And I would, I would argue that our challenges mimic what the national academies have, have uh, disclosed as they consider tier one universities trying to do these kinds of uh, transdisciplinary relationship building exercises. So to me, the, the, the biggest challenges are uh, ensuring parity uh, across the disciplines. So as opposed to thinking about, you know, audiology serving music, for example, we want to think about audiology benefiting from its relationship with music. And their stake in the relationship is just as profound and transformational as it is with the partnering or organization. So parity and then institutionalizing the relationship. I'm talking about just in terms of university settings, making sure that it's not a one-off project-based relationship, that it actually has lines of, of uh, administrative oversight that are secured and they're, 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 they're institutionalized. So it, it, everybody understands what the relationship is, where the funding streams are, how the grants are gonna go out, how the money's gonna be you know, uh, spent and from where. Uh, so yeah, parity and institutionalization, I think are the, uh, the two primary challenges. And if you can get that done, then you got a chance. Thanks, uh, Ralph, any thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I guess I'm thinking about it um, in terms of how to get it started if you're currently um, not uh, at a place that already has anything in place. And I would say, first of all, um, plan on this being a several year process. Um, there are things that we started working on in the 80s that um, have now come to fruition in the new millennium. Um, and to start out, look for individuals um, with whom you can start um, something small, a pilot project. Um, if there's one member of the, the music faculty who's more inclined to um, show an interest in the kinds of health promoting practices that um, we're interested in, um, you can get a, a toehold there and um, then um, develop um, it into the kinds of uh, more institutionalized response uh, programs that um, Chris was describing. Um, but if you keep plugging away at it, um, I think we're in a much better um, environment for making it happen now than we were 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and um, uh, the, you know, the kinds of programs like um, we've developed here with Eastman Performing Arts Medicine, um, I think can be developed in any, um, I, I would say at least sort of medium sized city. You do need some critical mass of um, people on the performing arts side and people on the healthcare and science um, sides. Um, but um, it's doable if you stick to it. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask Ken Johnson, um, my my partner in crime, how how did um, how did what, any advice that you have for starting something out like this? I mean, uh, again, I think that it it takes um, it's a collaboration of um, the, the the talent, the technique, and the technology. It's trying to blend the people who are very passionate about um, you know these these interests and, um, and working together to, to, to find a common goal. And I think that's the partnership that we found in you. I think, um, you know, it, it, uh, it takes a village sometimes, and this is one of those cases. Um, I've been very blessed with a, a, a skilled team of highly competent clinicians um, and an institution that has been very collaborative and creative in the ways that we've tried to to um, meet the needs of the student and faculty there. Um, you know, as an institution, you know, we've uh, been very flexible and have been able to be, again, creative in how we staffed and equipped the clinic. Um, and certainly those of you that know me, you know, I, I have, like, I'm already seeing like two steps down. So, you know, we really had to dial back, um, you know, where we started from and, and we've demonstrated success and we've grown that over time. 
Um, but yeah. it, it starts first with the people. I would, I would just like to jump in here and say I completely agree. Before it takes a village, it takes two, um, <laughs> at least to start something. And, um, and you know, we were told by our, our um, Hopkins Medicine folks, just show us proof of concept and then we can go from there. So we started very small um, and, and we're building from there. And um, so, I, and it definitely takes collaboration skills and determination and vision and passion, all of those things. Um, and we only have to look at our students to see the fact that their injuries are keeping them from doing and being who and what they want to be, to know that, you know, that that fuels us to go through all of the other pieces of figuring out the, the myriad of, of, of issues that have to be worked out. Um, I do have one more question here that I would like to ask Liliana and then the rest of the folks as we have time. This question is, how do you correlate emotional health with treating musculoskeletal pain? That's a very good question. Um, and personally, in all the research that I've been involved in and my teaching, my background is in psychology. Those are the lens I bring into the work I do. But working with people from physiology, biomechanics, physiotherapists, uh, musicians, dancers, you know, always working in an interdisciplinary way. I think and we all have that experience in this room that we have to look at things in a holistic comprehensive way if we keep separating things into different boxes you know it's a, a body matter it's a mind matter it's a, a technique matter uh, we'll probably struggle to go you know uh, or we can go further if we look at things in a holistic way which is quite challenging I think um, but I'm sure that Chris and Ralph and Ken you all have this experience that many of the multi the uh, musculoskeletal problems have some emotional baggage attached to that and I think that's that is a clear sign that we have to look at this at, the, at these issues that musicians bring to us in a very holistic way and that sometimes can be very very challenging if we don't have all these you know interdisciplinary teams if you work in very small environments but, but it's about starting to develop again that level of awareness among the, the musicians, young musicians, music students and professionals, that they are whole people. Uh, they, you know, they are not just pieces of their bodies or pieces of their minds. They, and yeah, uh, at Trinity Lab, and we have a growing interest in psychology uh, and the modules that we run in psychology are full. There's a waiting list for some of those modules because people want to know more about their emotional well-being, their health and well-being mm -hmm. uh, in more holistic way. And I think we are kind of um, developing that uh, in, in, in the way we, are, we work through pedagogy, through uh, the clinical work that we do at Trinity Lab. And, but I think that's something that the field is also acknowledging, that we have to look at these things in a holistic way. Whole mm -hmm. systems, getting, as, as Chris and Ralph were saying, collaborations, working with different people to address things in a, in a, a holistic way? That's, that's a big question. <laughs> it is a, one of many big questions, one of which I'd like to frame out and throw out as a challenge that we will not have time to address today, but to ask our panelists to give us their thoughts on this. The question is, I've noticed anecdotally that musicians are taking more interest in general notions of health via social media and other accessible platforms. I'm curious if the panel thinks that the pandemic presents an opportunity to increase awareness in the field of performing arts health in general, or if it is more detrimental than not. And uh, I would like to add to that, that since we know that our students are looking to the World Wide Web for information and support for their problems um, that they may be encountering right now. How can we ensure that we are guiding them to reliable sources? So even if we cannot, we don't have the time to answer it now, I would really strongly ask 
the faculty, uh, the, the uh, presenters here, if you can submit to us your best uh, thoughts about um, helpful resources, places that you would steer people towards as they are wandering through the, the netherworlds of the internet um, to help equip them with po positively with information. Um, and I also threw out that challenge to all the folks who joined us today. If you have resources that you would like to share with us as well, let's figure out a way to collect those um, and keep this conversation going. And with that, I turn it back over to Abra. You oh, are. Thank yes. you, Sarah. <laughs> thank you to the entire panel. You've given us a lot of very insightful and informative information today. And I do sincerely hope that we are able to keep this conversation moving forward.